All right. It's great to be with you all again. If you have a Bible, let's open up to Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. And while you turn there, I'll pray. Genesis chapter 37. Lord Jesus, hear our prayers. Lord, hear the worship that we bring. And we pray now that you would come near in a special way to minister to us through your word, Lord, according to your word, as you have promised to do in your word. Lord, fill us full of the Holy Spirit afresh to listen, to hear, to be soft, Lord, to be malleable in your hands. Would you be making us, changing us, transforming us into the men and the people that you want us to be, the men and women of faith, or who trust you, who love you, who rest in you, and therefore we obey you. We pray all this only in the name of Christ. Amen. Genesis chapter 37, and we really started a series last week on the idea of forgiveness. And so we looked at the concept of forgiveness last week in Genesis chapter 3, really. This week we're going to look at the first time where the idea of forgiveness is really specifically stated. We're going to look at the story of Joseph. Many of you are probably familiar with this story, which stretches from Genesis chapter 37 all the way to Genesis chapter 50. Don't worry, we're not going to read all of those 13 chapters. What we are going to do is kind of hit some of the high points, and I'll try to fill in maybe some of the details that we skip. Um, But Genesis chapter 37, and we basically want to look at the sin of Joseph's brothers primarily first in this chapter. So Genesis chapter 37, let's start in verse 4. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him, and they could not speak peaceably to him. Now, Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. Now, we find ourselves here in the story of Jacob, one of the patriarchs. He has 12 sons uh, by many different mothers, and Joseph is one of the younger sons, and Jacob holds Joseph in the highest regard. He treats him as his favorite, mainly because he was the firstborn uh, son of his favorite wife. Favoritism is a sin. For, for parents, certainly, to have a favorite child is a sin. And J- what we're going to see here, and I mentioned this last week, but sin splatters. Our sin doesn't stay in a vacuum. Our sin affects those around us. Jacob, if you go back and read his story, his father Isaac had had a favorite child. It wasn't him, and that had done damage in Jacob's heart. Jacob knew how bad of a sin this was, and yet he replicates it. His favoritism, favoring Joseph over his older brothers, leads to the older brothers being filled with envy, being filled with hatred. Okay, And guys, oftentimes, our own sin is a contributing factor, but other people's sin can be leading to our sin. And there can be a right way to say, the way this person sinned against me, it hurt me, and it's making me respond this way. And that's true to some degree, but we still bear responsibility for our response. We're not innocent in that. Look down to verse 11. In verse 11, and his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept this saying in mind. Now, hatred and jealousy are filling their hearts with Jacob because part of what's going on, excuse me, with Joseph, Jacob is giving special gifts to Joseph. He gives him a special robe that makes him stand out. And in some level, we, we're, this sermon is not primarily about Jacob, but we could talk about Jacob a lot. Jacob seems ignorant of what's going on with his children. He's not shepherding his flock well, so to speak. He doesn't know the condition of their heart. He's lavishing all this praise, all this responsibility on Joseph, promoting him in the household, so to speak. And the brothers are just growing in hatred, angry, jealousy, envy. Now skip down to verse 18. They saw him from afar. And before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of one of his dreams. Now again, if you're not familiar with this story, what happens, and we're skipping just for the sake of time, Joseph has a couple of different dreams. And the essence of the dreams are, Joseph, you're going to become a great leader. You're going to become such a great leader and ruler and man of influence that all of your brothers that hate you right now, older brothers, and even your own mother and father are going to, in a sense, bow down to you. They're going to follow you. They're going to submit to you. And Joseph, the best thing you could say about Joseph in the beginning is that he was terribly naive because he goes and shares these dreams with his brothers. Hey, guess what? I had a dream from God. 
One day I'm really going to be your boss. You're going to bow down and worship me. It didn't go over very well. Now, we may be able to say Joseph was innocent the first time. He has another dream, essentially the same message, and he comes back and says, hey, guys, guess what? Want to hear about the other dream I had? At this point, I think we have to chalk it up to more than stupidity. There must have been some pride in Joseph's heart. He was enjoying putting the salt in the wound, and it didn't lead to good things. All the brothers are out working in the field one day. And again, Jacob, in his ignorance, says, Joseph, go check up on your brothers. Make sure they're doing a good job. You're a responsible kid. I don't know if I trust them. Sends Joseph out to check up on them. And the brothers decide, we're going to put an end to this. We're going to kill him. Skip down to verse 23. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe. This is the special robe that the dad had given him, the robe of many colors that he wore. And they took him and they cast him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat. And looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum and balm and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him, for he's our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. The Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. Now, again, many of us in church are probably very familiar with this story, but I want us to try to put ourselves into more of kind of the emotional feeling that Joseph must have gone through. Keep your finger here in uh, chapter 37. We're coming right back. But just for a second, flip over to chapter 42, much later in the story. When they think Joseph is dead and gone, but they start to get convicted of their sin. Chapter 42 and skip down to verse 21 and listen to what they say. This is the brothers speaking. Genesis 42, 21. Then they said to one another, in truth, we are guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen. This is why this distress has come upon us. So now go back, chapter 37. You've got essentially... A bunch of teenage boys, maybe some 20-year-olds, a mixed family. Here comes the younger brother. He's 17 years old. Older brothers get him. Surely there was a scuffle. Probably beat him up a little bit. Remember, they're going to kill him at first. Strip off this prized possession, this robe that dad had given me. Throw him into a pit. That had to hurt. So he's laying down there, beaten, bloody, bruised. And they're just sitting up at the top of the pit having a pit break, a pit stop, just eating something, having a snack, probably talking, laughing, joking. Probably he's crying out, praying, begging, hey, guys, I'm sorry I've been such a punk little brother. I promise I'll be nicer. Please let me out, please. And again, they were this close to murdering him. That was the original plan. How cold-hearted. Then they see slave traders passing by. And Judah, whether he just loves money or he's like, a little bit conscience stricken. He's like, you know, murder's a really big, bad sin. Selling somebody into slavery, not quite as bad. Let's do that. They throw the rope down. Now think of what must have happened in Joseph's little heart. Okay, maybe they're going to have mercy. Maybe we can put this whole thing behind us. Maybe they finally listen to the, my cries and my screams. And they start to lift him out of the pit. He gets to the top of the pit and he sees these foreigners these tradesmen, and it starts to dawn on him what's going to happen. And back then, most of the time to be sold as a slave, it was a death sentence, the way you were going to be treated. How do you think he begged at that point? Again, when his brothers are like, we'll take the money, take this guy, and he's sold into slavery. I mean, this is evil at a very high and deep level. Skip down to verse 31. Then they took Joseph's robe, they slaughtered a goat, they dipped the robe in the blood, and they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, This we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. They do everything they can to guarantee nobody's going to go looking for Joseph. He's a dead man. He's a goner. Now, there's their sin. Now flip over to chapter 45, and we're going to look at forgiveness. Again, you may be familiar with the story. A famine has come. Joseph has been made ruler in Egypt, essentially. And Egypt back then would have been the superpower of the world. They would have been, in some sense, like the America back then, the most powerful, the most prosperous. 
And Joseph had some hard times there. He ended up in another pit, a prison. But in one day, he went from being a forgotten prisoner to being the prime minister, essentially being the number two to Pharaoh only of this superpower nation. And a famine comes, and he's in charge, and he's very wise, and he saves food. And they have so much food, they're not only feeding the Egyptians, they're feeding the surrounding nations. Now, they had begun to repent. Jacob's brothers, excuse me, Joseph's brothers had been sent by Jacob to go buy food in the famine. And God had been using these hardships and these trials to humble them. Jacob had actually been testing them. Again, we don't have time to do that. Actually, just look at chapter 44 for just a second. Chapter 44, starting verse 16. And Judah said, what shall we say to my Lord? And what shall we speak? Or how can we clear ourselves? God has found out the guilt of your servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also, in whose hand the cup has been found. So you start to see here some of the more the humility of Judah. And the story was this. Jacob, excuse me, Joseph was testing his brothers. And one of the ways that he would test them is he would take a prized possession. He would put it into the sack of his younger brother, the youngest brother, who was from his same birth mom. And then he would see if the older brothers would stand up for the younger brother. Or would they just cast him off like they'd cast him away? And the brothers are repenting. The brothers are really changing. They're like, no, 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 we're willing to be held guilty. You go read the whole story, it's pretty powerful. So in chapter 45 is where we're going to see Joseph say, okay, I've tested you. I've seen that you've really repented, you've really changed, and I'm going to forgive you. So pick up in chapter 45, verse 1. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by. He cried, make everyone go out for me, speaking of all his Egyptian servants. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed at his presence. They're shocked and they're probably a little fearful. Verse 4, so Joseph said to his brothers, come near me, please. And they came near and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. Now this is so important, guys, and we're going to kind of hammer down here, but please get it. How was Joseph able to forgive such a big, gigantic, life-altering sin? Because he saw God's goodness, God's sovereignty even over it. He doesn't sweep it under the rug. He doesn't say, hey, you guys didn't do anything big. He's like, no, no, you guys did a terrible thing. You sold me into slavery. And yet, God had a plan through that. And because of that, I can forgive you. Okay. Keep your finger here. Flip back to chapter 39 for just a second. Chapter 39. And this is maybe when Joseph is at his lowest even as a slave, he was trying to be a faithful slave, a hardworking slave, a trustworthy slave. But he gets falsely accused. He gets tossed into prison. And when he's at the bottom of the prison, Genesis chapter 39, verse 21, look at what it says. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Joseph had experienced the covenant-making, covenant-keeping love of God when he was at his lowest point. And to the degree that we are genuinely experiencing the grace of God in a forgiving way in our lives, it becomes more easy, it becomes more natural to express it to others. And that's part of what's going on here with Joseph. Back to chapter 45 and look at verse 6. For the famine has been in the land for these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Do you see how much Joseph's mindset has changed? I'm not just some little helpless boy that got beat up and sold into slavery and taken advantage of. I am a pawn in God's chess game. And God moved me exactly where he wanted me, exactly how he wanted me, exactly when he wanted me. And yeah, he used some evil actors to do it. But God's story, God's working is so much more powerful than the human evil actor's story. Amen. Now, 
Do you remember the story in the New Testament, Luke chapter 15, the parable of the prodigal son? And when the older son saw the lavish grace that God was showing to the younger son, the older brother didn't like it. You remember that story? He got mad about it. It's like, I don't want to go to the party. And sometimes we're like that, aren't we? Somebody we're mad at or has hurt us or embarrassed us, and we're like, God's going to show them grace? I don't want to go to that party. Joseph's not that way. Joseph has been so smitten with God's grace to him when he realized that now I'm going to be a conduit to show grace to even the people that almost murdered me, he's excited to do it. He's like, guys, grace is a really fun party. I've been living in it for a long time now. And guess what? I get to invite you guys into it. Yeah, I know you almost killed me, but I forgive you. This is real forgiveness. This is not fake forgiveness. This is not just going through the motions. This is not just saying the words. His heart is fully engaged. Look at verse 9. Hurry! Go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children and your flocks and your herds, all that you have. There I will provide for you, for there are yet five years of famine to come so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. And now your eyes see and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father of all my honor in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and he wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck and he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. After that, his brothers talked with him. They finally start to believe him. He's hugging them. He's kissing them. He's saying, guys, the famine's got five more years, and I'm going to do better than just give you enough grain to get by. Move your families here. Again, I'm the second most powerful person on planet Earth, and I'm going to use my power, my wealth, to bless you guys' socks off. Land, food, protection, wealth, you're going to be taken care of for as long as you live, and so are all your families. I mean, this is real forgiveness, guys, full and free. They don't deserve it. Look at verse 22. To each and all of them, he gave a change of clothes. But to Benjamin, he gave 300 shekels of silver and five changes of clothes. Now, it was a sin. It was forgiveness. But here's what we really want to look at this morning. Did they really and fully receive the forgiveness? Okay. So flip over to chapter 50. Now, this is five years later. I mean, excuse me, five chapters later. It's many years later. They have been living and thriving in Egypt, in royal land, especially secured for them for many years. But now Jacob, their father, after many years, he finally dies. And for those ten older brothers, that guilty conscience starts to get them a little bit again. And they start to worry. And they start to fear. And they start to fret. And I think here must have been the logic that went through their mind. Did Joseph really forgive us? I mean, we were bad. We, what we did to him was really hateful. It was evil, man. And maybe, maybe, Joseph really just wanted to be reconciled with his daddy, Jacob. So he played nice with us just so he could make up with dad. But now that dad's gone, maybe he's just been waiting I don't know how many of you are fans of The Godfather, okay? This is not necessarily the most family-friendly movie of all time to watch, but hypothetically, if any of you ever saw The Godfather 2, Michael's younger brother tries to kill him. He's not going to kill Fredo in return while mom's alive, but once mom's gone, Fredo gets a bullet. I think I've got the plot right. I hadn't seen it in a long time. And that's basically what Joseph's older brothers are fearing. Now that dad's gone, our protection is gone. They're not trusting Joseph's promise of forgiveness. They're not trusting Joseph's plans for mercies. They want their own plan. This reminds you of anything? Reminds you of Adam and Eve last week? I don't know if we trust God's plan for mercy. Let's try to make our own little fig leaf aprons. Has God really forgiven us? That's what Adam and Eve wrestled with. And Joseph's older brothers are saying, has Joseph really forgiven us? Maybe we need to fix this on our own accord. 
Okay? So chapter 50, and skip all the way down to 15. All the way down to 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgressions of the servants of God, of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Now, there is no evidence whatsoever, if you go read the entire... Oh, I've skipped a lot, but if you read every single verse in the Hebrew, there's no evidence Jacob ever said this to the brothers. This is made up. This is a lie. This is their fig leaf protection plan, insurance plan. Okay? Parents or children, if you've ever been a child in your life, that's everybody. Even the best parents sometimes, if there's a disobedient child, might raise their voice in anger. And maybe it's righteous anger. Stop it. How dare you do that? And then there's discipline, there's consequences, there's a spanking. But after the tears, there's a hug. There's a, I love you, I forgive you, it's over. Let's go get some ice cream together. And sometimes the petulant little child might be like, you don't love me, you hate me. Anybody else had an experience like that? And the parent, even in the sinful parent's heart, is thinking, no, I'm over it. It wasn't that big of a deal. In the grand scheme of things, it was enough of a deal to get a spanking, but the spanking's over. I love you. I'm happy. But there's something about the child's little hurt, fearful, angry heart can't fully receive forgiveness. Do you understand? And that's part of what's going on with Joseph's brothers. I mean, from what we have seen, would you say, had Joseph fully forgiven his brothers, yes or no? It's obvious. Everything about his demeanor, his words, his actions have lavished on them love, mercy, grace. But they are slow to trust. They are slow to believe. They are overwhelmed with guilt. I mean, they have experienced so many of the benefits of forgiveness. They're not dead. They could have been executed. They've got food. They've got land. But they're still living with some worry, with some doubt, with some distress. So I want you to think about this. Have you ever sinned against somebody? Maybe in your marriage. And you feel really bad. And you confess and you apologize. And your spouse comes and says, it's over. I forgive you. And they start treating you normally. But for whatever reason, you're still stricken with your guilty conscience. So you feel like you have to come back and say, hey, I'm really sorry. And they're like, hey, quit apologizing. It's over. There's something about many of us that have a hard time really fully receiving the generosity of grace and mercy. Now, there's a lot of application here at the human level, but that's really not the application I want to make this morning. We're going to get to that. I want us to think much more about our relationship with Father God. How many times is God the Father saying, it's over. I love you. Yes, I disciplined you for a while for that. But I'm not angry. You've got full forgiveness. It's free. And yet we live in this halfway territory. Again, remember the parable of the prodigal son. The younger son is out. Wicked sin takes so much of the father's wealth and just squanders it. And he comes back and the father, full forgiveness instantly. I love you. I forgive you. Shut up. I don't even want to hear your repentance speech. Wasn't that good anyway? Here's the robe of righteousness. Here's daddy's signet ring, platinum visa. Get him some shoes. This boy's all in. You're going to live in the family house. Now, this is not in the parable, okay? This is, this is my addition, and I'm not trying to add to Scripture. I'm just I'm, I'm meditating on Scripture with you publicly here. It's not hard to think about the next day after the big party, the returned prodigal waking up in the mansion, but still feeling so guilty. I was such a punk. I was, I wasted so a third of my dad's wealth. And getting up and feeling like, I got I to do something to pay him back. So waking up at the crack of dawn, going out into the field with the slaves, working in the field. 
with the guilt still hanging over his head. Can't you see him out there doing it? I got to pay daddy back. And then dad comes down for breakfast, so excited that his son that was gone, he gets to have breakfast with him for the first time in months, maybe years. And he's like, where's my boy? Uh, boss, he's out working because he feels like he's got to pay you back. I heard one preacher talking about this. He said, it's like a bunkhouse theology with God. And how many of us are tempted to live in that place with God? The debtor's ethic. Well, I know you gave me salvation, but I didn't deserve it. So I just got to work my tail off to pay you back. You ever feel like that? Let me just tell you one problem like that about that. You can't pay him back. <laughs> it's an infinite gift. And even in every time you do a good work, you're doing it on more barred grace to do it. You're really just going further in debt. It doesn't work. But the more important thing that's wrong with it is this, guys. That's not what the Father wants. Does the Father want you to be working for Him? Yes. But not out of a begrudging, fearful, I got to pay you back, but out of a joyful overflow, I got a great daddy, and my daddy likes me so much, he just takes me to work with him. I don't really help much. I probably make more messes than I actually help. But I just like being with my dad, and my dad likes being with me. That ought to be the motivation in a Christian's heart. Now, we can still be an adopted child of Father God, bought with the irredeemable blood of Jesus, but feel like a slave trying to work our way to heaven. Even though we know right theology, we don't always feel it. And guys, what I want us to partially see, do we see how arrogant that is? I mean, what if you had a child, and let's say he was into mountain biking or something like that, whatever it is, he's hunting, whatever, and there's a bike he wants or a gun he wants or something, and you say, there's no way this kid could ever afford this. And out of the love of your heart, you go and break the piggy bank, and for Christmas this year, you get him this $1,000 bike or this $1,000 gun or whatever it may be that he really wants. And he's like, thanks, Dad. But then he's like, he goes upstairs. He's like, Dad, this is all the money I got. I mean, there's something sweet about that. There's also something perverse about that. It's like, you don't get it. You don't have to pay me back. I don't want you to pay me back. It's almost offensive. I want you just to enjoy the gift fully. Receive it. Now, practically speaking, how does this work? Go down to verse 18. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God. As for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke to them kindly. This is the key verse, guys. This is the key insight. Joseph had had such a personal experience of God's grace, the bigger, truer, more real, more powerful story of God pursuing him, God loving him, God forgiving him, that all the evil that had been done to him, in a sense, he could just wipe it away. He could forgive it. He doesn't sweep it under the rug. He says, what you did was sin. What you did was evil. It's good that you own it. It's good that you repent. But I want you to know, I forgive you. I don't treat you that way anymore. You're not defined by that sin in my eyes. You're defined by being my brother. And the implication for us, guys, is that when we look to God, he says to us, yes, you're a sinner. You're a sinner so big and so bad, you deserve hell. And yet, there's a bigger story. There's a truer story that overwhelms that story that I love you, that I purchased you. You're not identified by your sin with me. You're identified by my blood that was spent for you. Imagine this story, and we're almost done. Imagine there was a guy dating a girl, falls in love, they get engaged, everything's going wonderful, and literally like the day before the wedding, she comes and breaks his heart. She's like, I've been having an affair with your best friend behind your back. I'm out of here. I'm eloping. 
with him. And the guy is distraught, depressed, angry, overwhelmed, understandably so. He starts going to counseling. He can barely survive. But the woman that he's meeting with for counseling, I don't know why he chose a woman for counseling, but he just did for the sake of the story, okay? She happens to be single. She's really godly. She's beautiful. She's smart. She's rich. She's everything. They fall in love. They end up getting married. And years later, he sees his original fiance. And he might say to her, hey, I want you to know, I totally forgive you. What you did, it was terrible. I mean, you're, you're a scoundrel. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not saying it wasn't a bad thing. It was terrible. But I want you to know that because of that, something bigger and better happened than I could have ever imagined. And I'm so much more in love with this new woman, even than I was with you. It's like the good story trumps the bad story. I'm not saying the bad story is not real. It's not there. It's just small by comparison. Does that make sense? And guys, that's a picture of how the gospel is supposed to work in our life. I got sin against God, against other people. People have sin against me. But there's a sense in which all these things are real. I need to take them seriously, but not too seriously. Because there's one bigger, better, truer, more real story called the gospel. That the Lord Jesus Christ hung his head and died on the cross and rose again to say, you're my brother. You're an adopted child of my father. All those are the little stories. They just don't really count anymore. They don't define you. Receive this grace fully. Be defined by it. I mean, ultimately, guys, the story of Joseph is a true story, but it's a foreshadowing. Because at the human level, Joseph was an innocent sufferer. He didn't deserve to be beat up, thrown into a pit, sold into slavery. But he suffered. And because he was willing to suffer and be faithful through the suffering, not just he got blessed, nations got blessed with physical salvation from all the food he was able to provide. And it's just a tiny little foreshadowing of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one true innocent sufferer, that because he was willing to die for us under the wrath of God, he doesn't just get hyper-exalted. All of us in him get hyper-exalted that trust in him. People from every tongue, tribe, and nation will benefit from this great grace. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you. We are so unworthy of your love. I pray that we would be able not just to more fully understand, but more fully receive, more fully appreciate, more fully rest in your forgiveness that is full and final and free. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your great gospel grace. Amen.